All right, welcome back. Welcome back. And of course, we are getting ready to speak with Dr. Faith B. Israel. And she's up. Yes, good morning and welcome, Doc. Good morning, Brother B. Good morning, Trinidad and Tobago. Good morning to all of you. Very good. And I trust all is well. And of course, and uh, all, I wish everything is okay with you and the family. Yes? Yes, yes, yes. I'm pretty good. Enjoying staying at home. I'm pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> You're enjoying it? Because, and Doc, let's just start there. You know, obviously, there are people who are saying that they are bored at home. I'm trying to figure out, I, I, I have not experienced boredom. Tell me, why, why are people feeling bored at home? Well, I think this is a new thing for, for people. And remember, Tobagonians are used to being social people. We are used to going out all the time. We are used to liming. We are used to our habits. We are used to our fets. We are used to just being around other people. So this, for many people, is not normal. This, for many people, is not okay. For me, it is because I am very introvert. You know, I am an only child. I, I love being by myself. So for me, this is quite normal. But I can imagine that for other people. Mm -hmm. It really, really is taxing, mm -hmm. and it is it's difficult to comprehend that we just can't do it. All right. Okay, so let's get into the topic. Of course, no new cases or no new... Um uh, no new imported cases. Uh, tell us what's next. What should we do? Or should we get complacent? What do we do from here on in? Well, you know, Brother B, I, to be honest, I am a little concerned eh? um, because, you know, I have always said from the beginning that our testing criteria in Trinidad and Tobago have always, always, always been too restrictive. And I think what we are seeing now is the fact that we were limiting the people who were tested. Because remember, the, the Caribbean Public Health Agency lab, they are the only lab that we've been using to test. Mm -hmm. And they have been following the World Health Organization case definitions. Mm -hmm. And those case definitions basically were uh, uh, three things. With somebody who presents with symptoms and who traveled to, to, to you know, a country where there was there were cases, somebody who presents with symptoms and who we know was connected or has been in contact with somebody who we know is a confirmed case. And as somebody who presents with symptoms is hospitalized and needs so uh, we can't figure out why they're hospitalized and they have flu-like symptoms. Now, if you look at those, um, those requirements, it means that if some random person off of the street had flu-like symptoms and they did not require hospitalization, so they're not sick, sick, sick to need to go in and lie in a bed kind of thing, it means that that person may not really have been tested for COVID-19. And, and because we had limited the number of people who we were testing, um, we now are at a point where we seem to have a plateau. No, really, I, I, I honestly think that those in Trinidad also are aware that we really had not been picking up everyone who we needed to pick up. Hmm. Because they are the ones who keep telling us, you know, you can't, don't relax just yet. And also we had additional um, restrictions put on us yesterday. So hmm. let, let, let me just put it this way. If everything is fine, meaning we have no new cases, we, uh, we, do, we haven't had a new case in, what, three, four, five days by now. If we don't have community spread, which is what they've been saying, we don't have community spread, meaning we don't have people who we are getting um, and they don't know where they're getting it from, although technically they would not have tested those people. If we, our borders are closed and everything else is fine, it means that we should be able to not relax the restrictions, but we, need, we should be able to maintain the restrictions and be fine. So the fact that they seem to be clamoring down and making these restrictions even worse makes me think that there is something else out there that we don't know about, that we are not confirmed about, but we still need to be worried, which, as they say, is the second and third wave of hmm. this thing. All right, let me, let's go with that and, and let's speak about how dangerous that possibility can, or how damaging that can be and how can we prevent. Now, I want to go back to a point you made, uh, and it has to do with testing, right? Um, the, the, there, are, <laughs> there are those carriers who show, and you mentioned it about the last time we spoke, I think, uh, anyway, uh, that uh, show no symptoms at all. However, uh, it doesn't show up until a couple of days, and sometimes that's too late because they would have come, in, come into contact with the individual. Let's talk about those people who are 
haven't shown any symptoms, may have known that they came into contact with somebody who would have died, and they would be told, hey, uh, we can't test you unless you have symptoms. Speak right. to and, that. And, uh, and let's, that, let's, yeah, let's go to that. That is exactly my point, because we have three categories of people who um, we were not going to catch. There are those who are asymptomatic, meaning they don't have symptoms at all. Mm -hmm. And we have seen from studies outside of Trinidad and Tobago that you can have it and not show any symptoms at all, at all, at all. Those are asymptomatic people. Okay, you asymptomatic know, is no symptoms, right? No symptoms oh, at all. Yeah, what's the next you, you, ne you never get symptoms. So, mm -hmm. you know, at, well, not never, because we haven't had a, a long enough time to figure it out. Mm -hmm. But for now, you have no symptoms. Mm -hmm. The second category are people who we classify as pre-symptomatic, meaning you have the virus, you are going to get symptoms, but it's too early. You haven't mm. started getting symptoms just yet. Mm. And then you have those who are, have mild symptoms, so very, very mild. They may just have a little cough, a little sniffle, a little, you know, sore throat, a little whatever. And you're thinking, well, I'm accustomed to get this cold, or every year I get the common cold, or whatever, whatever, and you don't think that it is uh, COVID-19 because it is not what we are seeing in terms of severe, severe cases. So we have these three categories of people who can be infectious, meaning they can pass the virus on to somebody else, but because we were so restrictive in how we were testing in Trinidad and Tobago, we really may not have picked up those people. And I have always said, because, you know, I listened to the, uh, uh, UE, UE Mona Campus had a COVID-19 conference online yesterday, and I listened to the entire thing. And one of the things they suggested is that, you know, and the world is saying, you need to do more testing. Of course, if you have no resources or if you have very limited resources, you have to prioritize who you test. That's a given. But if you have resources, then you need to expand your testing all the way down to doing surveillance testing, because that is where we would really pick up how many people really, really, really have this virus. And let me just give an example. If we do surveillance testing in Tobago and we use a, a, a two-tier level, first tier meaning everyone who comes in with, um, with, with, with flu-like symptoms, we test them, if we do that. And at the second tier, we go out and we randomly pick, you know, every 100th person that we find, whether they have symptoms or not, we test them. I calculate that if we just do every 100 person, we have 60,000 people on this island. That's really 600 tests. According to CASA, the test costs about 250 US dollars. So when I did the calculation using a, a, um, an exchange rate of $7 and multiply that by, by 600 people, the cost of doing surveillance testing in Tobago just for the test would be a, a little over a million, a million uh, 50,000. Which, when you think about how much money we spend on utter foolishness, whether be, mm. that really is no money to put out to do our testing here, to do surveillance testing, so that we could pick up. Because remember, Tobago is smaller. Tobago is closer knit. Tobago is more likely that even if somebody in 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 uh, a crown point gets it, that person may have come into contact with somebody from Charlottesville just because of who we are and how we move and how our circles are pretty tight. Mm -hmm. um, we need to do that kind of expansive testing, even if Trinidad is not doing that kind of expansive testing. And we can afford to do it. That is my point. Because a lot of people tell you the testing is expensive, but you have to think about expensive compared to, to what? Safety we spent, yeah. what, uh, $13 mm -hmm. million dollars last year right. on jazz. We were willing to spend probably about the same amount on jazz mm -hmm. this year if COVID-19 didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Using a million, a little over a million dollars, to do a wider range of testing in Tobago is no money in my mind, and I'm sure in the average Tobagonian's mm -hmm. mind, when you think about what we could pick up versus what is out there. Right. Because what I am afraid, mm -hmm. and what I am sure they are afraid of, is the fact that there are all of these cases that are hidden, that because they were so restrictive in their testing criteria, and they are on the ground, and that when they do start their surveillance testing in Trinidad and Tobago, which they are doing, they are going to start shortly, they would pick up way more, and we would see way more, and that is where the second and third wave of this would come. My, my. All right, so based on what you're saying, uh, you're still clamoring for, which, I mean, is reasonable, 
that Tobago should has its own, have its own testing, its own unit to accommodate testing. As you pointed out, as you pointed out, there are people who would have the virus and don't know because they show no symptoms. And for that to be detected, there has to be random or there has to be vigorous testing. That is the point you're making. Yes, yes. And, and we need to do it in Tobago, where we make our decisions about who is tested in Tobago. And that's a critical point. Because I don't want us to go away. Because uh, last week or maybe the week ago, uh, the week before, I heard them speak about the fact that we had um, a couple of technicians, lab technicians, going to Trinidad to learn how to do the test, which is wonderful, that we are getting machines from Trinidad when next uh, the Minister of Health gets his batch of machines. I think they said by the end of April we should be able to get a machine and so forth, which is all fine. What I am clamoring for is that when we get the tests in Tobago, when we get it going, that we make the decisions on who gets tested and not leave that up to the restrictive um, uh, requirements that Trinidad has. Because, let me also explain, even though the Minister of Health explained last week or maybe the week before that they will also start doing surveillance testing, their surveillance testing, again, would still just be limited to people who come into the health centers with flu-like symptoms, because they want to get a sense of what kinds of, of respiratory uh, illnesses we have in the country. So they also will not be testing anybody who does not have the symptoms, and that's the critical point. Tobago needs to bite the bullet and say, okay, even if you guys are limiting your testing that way in Trinidad, because of our circumstances in Tobago, because of who we are, because of our geography, because of our close-knitness on this island, we need to expand who gets tested here. And we will pay for it. If the issue is money, we will pay for it. Or we could go to the Heritage and Stabilization Fund, go to the Minister of Finance, the same way Trinidad is going to the Minister of Finance and say, hey, we need the additional money to do these things, because that is what Trinidad is doing. Mm -hmm. All right, Dr. Fitz, stay right there. We go for a break. When we come back, we continue our very healthy conversation. See you after the break. Thank you. back and we are continuing our conversation with Dr. Faith B. Israel uh, and of course uh, uh, we're in the middle of uh, the, uh, that aspect of this uh, and the unpredictable part of this disease has to do with uh, not knowing uh, there are people who would have uh, <clears throat> carrying or more or less the, the virus and we don't know because they show no symptoms and they are not allowed to be tested however Dr. Faith has a different view as to how we can deal with that. Dr. Faith um, continuing along that vein um, uh, the prime, they have allowed for uh, testings outside of CAFA to be done. However, that has to be approved from, uh, or got the, should we say the, the, the well, the approval from CAFRA themselves, from, yes, from CAFRA, public, uh, Caribbean Public uh, Health Agency. Just speak to that and what should be allowed or what should we have in Tobago to do that? Um, should there be a, a lab in Tobago per se that uh, get that accreditation so as to carry out the tests. Uh, tell us from your standpoint what should be done, given that the, the, uh, the Minister of Health has given the all clear for testing to be done outside of CAFRA. Okay, so there was actually some, um, some, some misunderstanding about what needs to be done. And uh, when the Minister for Health spoke about having private labs get certified in essence, I, I know, I'm not sure he used that word, eh, but he, he insinuated that they needed to get certified from CAFA. Mm -hmm. um, what, the public, what the private labs told us is that actually, no, there is no law in Trinidad and Tobago that says that CAFA needs to certify any private lab. The Ministry of Health uh, has its responsibilities as it relates to labs and so forth. What we want, though, is that what we want is to have to ensure that the results that come out of labs, any labs, whether it's a private lab or a public lab, is accurate. And that is what we need to ensure that that happens. What we also need is to ensure that if you go to a, there is a system, so that even if you go to a private lab, that your numbers are counted with 
in the national system. Mm. So even if you go to a private lab, the lab is also required to then say to the Ministry of Health or say to the Division right. of Health mm -hmm. or say to the TRHA, hey, this person came, this person tested positive. So everyone has the data. And that is what is critical. Two things, that the results are accurate and that the, the data goes to the TRHA, to the Division of Health and Ooh. to the Ministry of Health. Right. Let, let's stay there a little bit. I like that. It's juicy and nice juicy bone you give me there to chew on. Now, the, the, right. so, so that person is tested here in Tobago. The lab is certified and so on. When that person is tested and is positive, uh, in that space where that, done, that is done, obviously all the necessary gears and so on, that person should not be allowed, this, I just, I'm asking from my own understanding, cannot be allowed to leave the premises unless escorted by the relevant authorities, the people with the correct gears, that person and their family should be quarantined. Tell us what, should that happen? Um, someone is tested positive with a lab in Tobago, what should be the protocol treating with their families and all of those individuals who would have come into contact with that person? Well, the, the thing is that we have to look at, again, resources. The places where it has worked and worked very well, what they did was do thermal testing. They uh, have been tested their temperatures. And if anyone was positive, um, because in those other places there were large volumes of people, what they did is ensure that the, that person did not then, for example, go into a regular taxi to go Good, home. good. The person yes. was escorted home mm -hmm. and then given very, very clear instructions about what needs to happen when they are home. Because you also don't want that person, because they feel well, to then interact with their family and then get their entire family sick. Now, the, uh, in Tobago, what they have been doing at an interim down in Tobago, what they have been doing is basically holding everyone who has confirmed COVID-19. So they don't allow you to go home mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and recuperate at home. They keep you in one of your well, one of their well facilities. Mm -hmm. and my understanding is that the, the fort, the, the old hospital of the fort, is where we've identified to keep people who are well but COVID positive mm -hmm. in Tobago. And that is actually a very good, um, a very good process, a very good standard. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, if we get to the point where the numbers are just too high to do that, then that would not be practical anymore. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a good first step to try to contain try to contain the virus because, you know, when you allow people to go home, they then mm. feel that they're okay and they start mingling and family exactly. come over and that kind of stuff, and which is what you don't want because that is going to cause spread. Right. So keeping them contained is the first thing. And if the numbers don't allow for us to continue that, then definitely have very, very strict protocol when it comes to isolating at home. But let me also say... Um, in other places where it worked very well, when they said isolate at home, there was an entire system that also tracked people at home, even quarantining, to ensure that you had, like, for example, I heard a story about Cuba. Um, I think it was Cuba, don't quote me on that one, where you would have a surveillance group of people, surveillance teams that actually go in and check you. So you're supposed to be home. They come in by you every so often, not announced to ask where are you, are you home, call you, come outside. If you're not there, then there's another quote-unquote surveillance team with police and so forth that come and find you and then quote-unquote put you away because you are not following the rules. Mm -hmm. There are other countries where they use apps on their phone mm -hmm. to track where you are, to track your, your symptoms and so forth. So there are different ways of, of managing that process to, to ensure that we get it right. Okay. All right. Let, let's deal with and staying with the, the topic, uh, no new imported cases. Um, however, our brothers and sisters in Barbados at 30, how many of them are uh, wanting to come home, understanding that they are to have uh, come on a chartered flight? And there are other Trin Trinbigonians who are in different parts of the world. Obviously, the borders are closed. However, attorneys and legal ramifications are allowing them to come into the country. Let's talk about what can we do to ensure that these individuals who return home, being that we have no imported cases, what are we to do, or new imported cases, to do uh, as far as a, a protocol for when those individuals come, do come back home in Trinidad and Tobago? Well, that, that is tricky, because to be honest, if it 
air, an airplane, unless you are on a jet all by yourself or a private plane all by yourself, is a very risky place to be. If you recognize you are consigned in a close space with other people, that is a very, very, very risky thing. Unless we've tested all of those people over and over and over and over and over again to ensure that they don't have uh, COVID-19, I think that right now it, it, it is the safest thing for them to stay put. Now, if we do agree that they are going to come home and they do come home, of course, because they've been in that very unsafe space of an airplane, it means that when they come here, we almost have to start the process over again in terms of the, the quarantining, keeping them separate from everyone else and so forth, just to make sure that they did not, um, they did not bring it in with them and then start a whole new set of infections again in Trinidad and Tobago. So, yes, I agree that it, it's hard, and, and, and it's, of course, I would want to come home, but when you think about the practicalities of it, when you think about how dangerous being on a flight is, because imagine, eh, there may be 30 of you or so, 29 of you are fine, but one of you, hmm, not so fine, and then you all get on a plane and suddenly you went from one having COVID to now 10 having COVID. Mm -hmm. That is what we're trying to prevent. Okay. And, and, and that is what we need to be very, very careful of when it comes to getting on a plane mm -hmm. in particular to, right. to, to travel. All right. Now, we have a case where police had to chase home, and I use in local <laughs> parlance for that. Uh, people who are hardened uh, would still be going out unnecessarily. Um, I want you to speak to that, given that we are taking it for granted. We have had no new cases. Uh, a couple, as you mentioned uh, a while ago, um, we have had 114 positive tests cases, eight deaths, and 21 persons released. And those figures have been consistent from a couple of days ago up until now. And people are taking that for granted to say, hey, listen, we're out of the woods. Speak to us as to let us know. Well, just tell us, give us your view on that uh, type of mindset. Well, honestly, if, if we were really out of the woods, then we would not have gotten the letter yesterday from the Ministry of Health telling us that our hardware is now need to close <laughs> down and we need further restrictions, right. if we were really, really out of the woods. So, no, we are not out of the woods. And to the people who keep liming, the people who keep going out and, and, and not being responsible, but be, I think that is, it is the... It is the I don't know. I, I'm trying not to cuss on national TV. <laughs> <Don't go. laughs> <laughs> because it is the dumbest thing right. ever. We have to be responsible. Yeah. Even if you are not responsible for yourself, consider that your mother, consider that your grandmother, consider that your auntie, who would feed you whenever you're hungry and pass by she, may have heart disease, diabetes. So when you go out and lie on the block, you may pick it up and take it to her. I mean, it is just so irresponsible and it is so, it is so heartless. And unfortunately, I am seeing where people who we think should be rational, understanding, loving, caring human beings are showing that they are really just very, 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 very selfish. Very, very selfish and uncaring and unloving and unkind to, to the people who they should be loving and to the people who they should care about for them to keep putting themselves and their families at risk like this. I am very, very disappointed every time I hear about it. I am extremely disappointed. And, and honestly, I, I thought that Tobigonians were better than that. I thought that Tobigonians had, quote, unquote, more sense than that. I actually told a good friend of mine the other day that they were a, a delinquent because of how they were behaving, and I, I meant it. Mm. I, I use other language too, eh? but that is the only <laughs> word I can repeat. When I see you, you're going to tell me yes. Yes, 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 that they were delinquent. Right. And, and, it, and it actually hurts me when I see people behaving so recklessly yeah. because the possibility is all, it's so close. It is so close to every one of us, and we just need to do it for a, a relatively decent short period of time, and then we could all relax again a little later. Good. All right. And then, and then we just, you know, as, uh, as um, you know, um, there are cases, according to Sergeant Alicia Pigott, where domestic violence seems to be on the rise as a result of people being at home. And I just want your appeal in your, you know, to your community, to all of us. As uh, you know, as a, a person in our legislature, in our, in our, I don't want to say any politics, but however, as a representative, let me put it that way. Now, l l I want you to just speak to your community and to entire Tobago about the people who may get frustrated as a result of being confined and so on. And, um, you know, uh, from that standpoint, and clearly we can't afford to lose our people, uh, losing themselves as a result of the frustration that they have to go through on a daily basis at home.
Well, you know, it, 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 it really is hard. Eh? And I, I know for a fact that this is a frustrating period. People are having emotions that we have not had before. Um, people are having emotions coming at a rate that we've not had it before. We've, I don't know that we've ever, any of us who are alive now, for most of the world, have never experienced where there is this thing that can kill us so eminently, that, that can damage us so badly that we have to now experience fear. We have to now experience anger. We have to now experience frustration because, remember, we now have people who were working and are not working just right now. Money isn't coming in. They were already barely making it paycheck to paycheck and now have to deal with that. So, you know, we are asking people to, to be kind to yourself. Understand that it is fine to feel these emotions. There is nothing wrong with you. It's quite normal to be sad. It's quite normal to be frustrated. It's quite normal to be angry, as a matter of fact. And once you allow yourself to, 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 to be kind to yourself and recognize that it's okay to have those emotions, we can now say, okay, but this is how I'm going to deal with it. I'm not going to lash out. I'm not going to hit. I'm not going to, to drink excessively. I'm not going to do any of those things because those things will not make this situation any better. They will actually make them worse. And, and see if we can reach out to others who could help us walk through the situation and help us talk through the situation. Mm -hmm. This is a time for you to start calling your friends and family and just saying, hey, how you're going, eh? Mm -hmm. Because that hey, how you're going may be the only uh, opportunity for them to really, really express the, the emotions that they are going through right now. Mm -hmm. And they need to be able to express them. Because that's the other thing. When you keep it bottled up inside, when it comes out, it comes out exactly. exploding. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and that is what we don't need. That okay. is what we don't want. But it's okay. All of the feelings that we are having right now, those feelings are fine. Those feelings are normal. Those feelings are expected. And don't think that you are the only one feeling like that. Because all of us. All of us are feeling like that, and we just need to be able to manage this little period so that we can all get over this hump and, and get to the brighter side of 2020. Excellent. All right. Well, I want to thank you very, very much. And, of course, always very informative and to the point. And, you know, I really, really, we really appreciate all the information that you shared with us. Do have a wonderful day and uh, the rest of COVID as you continue to practice uh, social distancing. All right. All the best. Thanks. Thank you. My pleasure. All right. All right. And of course, Dr. Feed the Israel and, you know, speaking directly to it. And of course, she said, sometimes I just feel to cuss, you know, and I used to say that very well often when I was in another place, wherever you say, wherever you're on TV, no, you can't say you feel to cuss. But um, sometimes you really have to, you know, bring the point home for people to get it and you have to speak in their language, you know. And sometimes, you know, the other day I was, I was going home and I see some fellas playing a small goal on the road. I stop. I write in the middle of the small goal. I say, I'm not moving. I said, all you knew what all you're doing. I said, all your pelt, all your tail inside. The, 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 um, you know, the, the, the family, the parents and so on, watch out the window. I tell them that already, you know, better be all right. And so on and so on. I said, all you want me to cuss? All you don't know I just cuss. I say, all your pelt, all your tail, and go inside. And so, you know, and of course, you know young people, and they want to, you know, be, you know, exercise and so on. But, you know, do it within the confines of your home, please. We are going to see the silver lining behind this dark cloud we're passing, according to Black Stalin. We're going for a break. When we come back, we have lots more for you. See you then.